Okay, so this is the circuit that I'm going to show you that now uses a replacement for this old vibrator here. We've got a, a circuit here. Let me just show, quickly show you. So this is a direct replacement for this. And that means we're able to get our radio working without risking damaging this. So let me just show you how that new circuit works. Well, first of all, here's just a, a black box idea of that circuit. And this will be then we can just use that and go through the same scenario again with, as we did with the me mechanical vibrator. So this we will call a solid state vibrator. It works very similar to the to the other vibrator. Oh, there's some slight differences. We have to add a couple of diodes, and I'll go through that as we talk through this. So this particular uh, circuitry here, I'm just temporarily describing this in a black box. Inside this circuit, it will automatically flip a switch between this trace of the circuitry or this one. It will flip that switch at a particular frequency. It's about 100 cycles a second. Let's imagine that the switch at the moment is connecting this side. So what's going to happen? Well, you've got a completed circuit now around here. We've got charges moving through. They're moving through this part of the coil, the primary coil. They're coming back through this solid state vibrator and they're going through this. The switch part is still activated on this side. So this is all during this one hundredth of a second. So they're going back through and then back to the other side of the battery. Again, we've got a completed circuit. So all the links of the charges, if you like, all linked together. They all move together. They're all pushed through by this battery. When they get to the other side of the battery, they're pushed up to a higher potential and they're pushed out of the positive terminal, then at higher potential, and they go through the whole thing again. That keeps going for that one hundredth of a second. Again, this is a center tap transformer on both sides. The top part of this primary is not doing anything because there's nothing connected to this side. So you haven't got a completed circuit. So this top part of the primary has no charge flowing through it. It's only flowing through here in this direction. So if it's moving through this direction, then what's it going to do to the secondary coil on the transformer? What we've got here is a magnetic field pushing any charges within this piece of the wire up. If you push them in this direction, what would happen? Well, you would be up against a diode here. That's like an open circuit. That means that charges won't flow through this part of the coil at all because they're being pushed up against a diode. So it can't move that way. So therefore, they go through this center tap. They go down through here, through this line. Again, they're going through across the smoothing capacitors again. And as before, they're going back into the common. So if they're being pushed into the common, they've got to be coming out of the common somewhere. Well, that's where the completed circuit is. They're coming out of here. And so you can see they're, they're being, if you like, the magnetic field's pushing these. It's almost like pulling the rest of this link of chain through from the ground. So the charge is being pulling up through the ground. The same, you know, the charge is at the same time being pushed into the ground. So you've got a completed circuit on the first one hundredth of a second. So that's this top section. Now, if we look at the bottom section, on the second one hundredth of a second, this switch now has gone like so. That one was like that. The switch now is made here, and there's no switch across here now. So if there's no switch across here, then no circuit can exist in this part of the circuit now. This now becomes part of the circuit. So what happens? Well, because that's connected to here, the charges now have got a completed circuit. They can all push against each other and move around. Now on the other side, same argument as before here. This case, the charges now are being pushed by the magnetic field down uh, opposite to where these are moving. Everything's moving at exactly the same instant in time. They're all moving, they push back into the ground where they were sucked out of the ground initially. So it's a complete circuit. So everything's moving together. Because it's a completed circuit, they can all move together. That's how it works. Now, the actual vibrator as well. So if we look at that square block, look at this square block here. That's this square block here. Now, I've put a video below of one of the early ones that I'm uh, flashing LED description of how it works. Now that's also an A-stable multivibrator. And if you watch that, 
it explains exactly how this piece of circuitry works but I'll just quickly go through this you've got two bipolar transistors these are uh, smaller transistors which can't take a lot of power then on the outside you've got these large MOSFETs which can handle large currents the only difference between the the one that I'll link down below the video and this circuit is the addition of these uh, MOSFETs because if you try to put that you know a 12 volt battery across this circuit on its own it would just burn out these transistors because they can't handle large amounts of current basically what's happening here is this bit of circuitry in the middle is switching this MOSFET on this MOSFET off then it switches this MOSFET on and then this MOSFET off and it just keeps doing that and it's doing that MOSFET's on that MOSFET's off it alternates between them and it does it about 100 times a second this is the circuit we're going to test out this transformer is not the same that's going to be in the valve radio the valve radio transformer has the two center taps as in the uh, the diagram we we went through so it's in the radio itself you've got two center taps but i haven't got one of those uh, except for the one in the radio which I, I i don't want to wire this up to yet so i've used this one now this one is a center tap on one side and no center tap on the other side so so of course that doesn't stop us having a look because of course we can what we what we've got here now is just a 12 volts but it's not 12 volts the reason it's not 12 volts is the scope uh, this is a 12 volt to 230 volt transformer so if I did put 12 volts on the uh, primary and I got 230 on the secondary well it's not two th that's 230 root mean square volts the actual peak to peak voltage that you'd see on an oscilloscope would be uh, 2.8 times that would be about 600 volts or so well the oscilloscope I'm using and most oscilloscopes only go up to 400 peak to peak so what I've done is I've taken the 12 volt I'm using a 12 volt battery but what I've done now is just put a resistor in series with the 12 volt battery to bring the voltage down so this transformer is probably something like six getting an input so this input is probably about six volts uh, that then allows me to actually see the the shape of the sine curve so the output voltage we'll be measuring will be less than the actual circuit will run in, in when it's replacing the vibrator what we want to see is we want to make sure that the uh, frequency is, is the same as what this is was designed to run at we want to compare the actual peak to peak voltage multi uh, divided by 2.8 to get the rough root mean squared and then check that against the uh, the voltmeter just to see how you can do that just as an example so it also it'd be interesting to see the shape of the actual uh, sine curve because remember what we're doing here is we've got a 12 volt battery which is DC and we're trying to generate an AC voltage on the other side it's not going to be a perfect sine curve but if we get something similar to a sine curve then that's good enough hey, back in the day that's all they needed really was something that's going to give them you know the voltage that they needed and then of course from the other side of this then we just would rectify that so anyway well, let's just fire it up and see what happens so the scope probe is already wired up here uh, the 12 volt battery I'm just going to connect that up now and just check that it's working on the scope let me show you what the scope will look like when the battery is connected up so here we have the scope and I'm going to connect up the uh, the 12 volt battery now so you should be able to see the transition from it not connected to it being connected and right and there you go we've got the output signal now that's you can see that's a sine wave but it's a it's not a very nice sine wave but it is one it is a sine wave so uh, you can see it's messy but it's there so what we what we want to do now is first of all the first thing we want to do is measure roughly the frequency which is one maximum to the next maximum that's a full cycle you can see the cycle keeps repeating after that so you can see the cycle there or or from there or, or from here rather to there that's a cycle from there to there you see it keeps repeating so what we want to do is measure how long one cycle takes so we're going to take this value here or this value and we'll just start it here so we'll start it there we've got one two three four five five divisions and on the time base it's showing two milliseconds so let's just see what the how long a cycle takes so 
a cycle according to the scope is taking five times two is 10 milliseconds. We know that 10 milliseconds is 0 0.01. It takes 0 0.01 of a second to complete a full cycle. If we want to know how many cycles are inside one second, then it's one divided by that number. That gives us how many of those cycles are in one second. Basically, just invert it. So if we invert that, so we've got the frequency. So there you go. So it's 100 cycles every second, which is good because looking at the uh, the literature on these vibrators, they always say uh, these vibrators generally were designed to run about 100 cycles a second. So that's good. That's, that's showing us that this solid state... Um, vibrator is within the right ballpark. The other thing I'm going to do now is just quickly measure the voltage on the output. I mean I haven't actually measured the input voltage from the 12 volt battery but I think it's about 6 volts roughly. What we'll do is we'll measure the output voltage from the scope and then compare it with the voltmeter to see what the difference is. It's a good example of using root mean square anyway if you're not used to using that. What I'm going to do now is measure the peak to peak value on this so let's get it as high as we can get away with and then we want to just measure the peak to peak so we're going to start from okay that just fills the screen quite nicely so we've got one two three four five six call that seven and that's two volts per division so that would give us seven times two so that would be fourteen the scope probe is ten times so fourteen that's a hundred and forty so what we're looking at then is roughly a hundred and forty volts measured by the scope peak to peak now what would that be in root mean square well we'd have to divide that by 2.8 so let's divide that by 2.8 that gives us the root mean square so that gives us about 50 volts so what we want to see roughly when we use our when we use this we want to see roughly a voltage measuring across those by that voltmeter of about 50 volts let's see what we actually do get the scope's going to be more accurate than this, but we should see roughly the same values. I'm going to measure the actual voltage across it now using this as opposed to the scope. And let's see what it says on here. So we push that over there. And you can see that's saying 55. So that's pretty close. So that's good. It's a it's good example of how you can use root mean square values and get a a rough estimate of the peak to peak value or vice versa. I'm quite happy with that. I'm going to go with that. Uh, when I go on further to restore the actual power pack of the radio, I will use that solid state vibrator as opposed to the damaging this one here. We want to keep this one. And once the whole radio is working, the power pack is working, then I might look at trying to make sure this is OK. But we want to get everything else OK first, because this is probably the most the rarest part of the whole radio this I want to make sure that we can try and salvage this and hopefully this is still working but I don't want to put it through any tests or anything until I know that the actual power supply unit itself is okay and we'll we'll find this will be the last part that I'll put in the radio uh, the rest of the radio all the valves and everything I've sourced all the parts they can all be obtained there's no problem with the rest of the radio it's just this vibrator now a lot of people will just say just use a solid state vibrator and don't worry about it but it would be nice to be able to hear this because these things when they go off you can hear them buzzing yeah and that's quite um well it's going to be quite nostalgic you know and uh it puts more value on on the actual radio and the car that the radio belongs to the original radio that came out of the factory so uh, it just adds more value to the whole car. So that's what we're doing, and uh, I'll catch you in the next video.